So if the guys that are making more money and they're in a place that you want to be in are doing all this healthy stuff, if you're an entrepreneur, that's probably one of the first things you should probably do, you know, because now your brain is better. We went to Europe for the first time. And the first uh, thing you realize is why is there no fat people? <laughs> and uh, then you start realizing how much stuff is in our food, like you said. When I worked for an insurance company, they did their recruitment in gyms because they knew people with good bodies were hard workers. Them as a box of rocks, who cares? Yeah, they you work hard. Guess what? You understand that persistence, consistency are key things to getting what you want. All right, guys, welcome back. This is episode 12, and I'm here with the local buff guy, Charles Boyer. Welcome to the show. What's up? All right, so the first question I got for you is, how old were you when you first benched 225 pounds? Oh, man. Well, I used to wrestle, so I did that back in high school, at least probably like 17. Yeah. And was that a big day well, for you? I, actually, I'm sorry, man. I forgot. I was at a you know checker pass, so I was in and out of DH, so I did a lot of push-ups as a kid. Okay, so you were prepped for it? Yeah, I was prepped for it. So it was probably about like 15, 16 where I threw a 225. And do you think that's like the biggest milestone for most young guys when they start lifting? You know what? Uh, according to media, uh, that's the big, hey, if you can lift 225, <laughs> then you're, so I do hear that a lot. Uh, that is a goal a lot of people are striving for. And how many people do you think when they do that 225, they could also squat it? <laughs> You know what, man? I'm not going to get into, like, people trying to blow up their chest and not hit their legs, you know? Yeah. care how many uh, memes or anything go about never skip legs day. Leg day. Uh, some people just don't like the pain, you know, so. They don't want to do it? Yeah, so they, they, they'd rather do 225 on bench. <laughs> All right, so the real question is, uh, how did you get into lifting? So you said it started off with a lot of body weight stuff. Well, I actually got, yeah, I got into lifting, yeah, as a kid. I mean, I was always, uh and I was always in and out of trouble. So I was always in and out of DH. <laughs> so it was nothing to do but push-ups and sit-ups and, you know, try to bench the, the bed. So uh, outside of, you know, being incarcerated as a kid, <laughs> you know, I, I was playing sports. So I was always working out. Uh, my dad was a real big um, football guy. So, you know, I had some guidance a little bit. Yeah. Kid. And what sports did you play growing up? Uh, mainly wrestling and football. Uh, I was in the martial arts, um, but, you know, wrestling and football is what? Those are your main two? Main ones. Yeah. And then I know we've talked about it before, but you were also in the military, correct? Yes, I was. And how old were you when that started? Uh, I enlisted when I was 18 right out of high school. And how long did you serve for? Uh, four years. Yeah. So in that time period, was that when you kind of first got into where other people were asking you for help lifting or did that start in high school? Man, yeah, that definitely happened uh, after the military. Uh, well, actually, during the military. Uh, that was the first time I ever did a competition. The only time I did competitions in the military because uh, uh, I didn't like the politics behind it. And for some reason, not for some reason, just like anybody, I mean, I was always in competition with myself. You know? Yeah. I don't want anybody else, you know, being over me, telling me, you know, what I am when I know what I am. And whether I win in their eyes, it really matters. I win, win in my eyes. So. And did you want, like, when did you make the decision that you wanted to compete? Or was that something other people told you to do? I was bored, man. You know, I was, I was in the military. I, I, I was overseas. I was away from my family. Uh, I had a daughter. Um, you know, I was fresh off of a deployment. So I was like, <sighs> antsy. I didn't want to get in any more trouble in the military because I was young, you know, um, Military is like college, so yeah. it was like, I like working out. So I stayed in the gyms. It's like, hey, it's a competition. I'll do a competition. They'll give me something to strive for. So, yeah, I was just bored, man, and I liked to work out. I needed something to do with my time. And it was bodybuilding, not powerlifting, right? No, it was bodybuilding. Yeah. yeah. And so what did your prep look like? Were you already pretty lean, or was this something where you knew you needed to start taking the diet seriously? Well, I just came off of deployment, man, so I wasn't, like, really um, big. I was lean, uh, I was doing a lot of workouts um, with random equipment, <laughs> you know, trying to keep my muscle. And I was eating limited, you know, food. So I was more concerned with just get, getting through the time. So, man, I was already. And what was the military food like? So you're lifting hard. You're obviously doing stuff in the military. Like, are they how, how many calories do you think you were getting back then? Man, I was eating a lot. 
Yeah. Because because I, I was lean, uh, you know, from deployment. So I was probably eating about like 4,000. Yeah, I was throwing it in calories. And so when people started asking for help, was it in the back of your head like, man, I've always wanted to be a personal trainer? Or was it something where it came to you? I mean, I just always like helping people, you know. So um, I'm extra extroverted. And I don't know. I just always feel good when I help somebody. So, you know, it's, it's fulfilling, you know, in here. So once I learn how to you know, change my body and other people, that was just another tool for me to interact with people and help people, you know, so. And do you remember who you were like almost first client was where it wasn't just like, oh, I lifted with this guy, but it was where like, hey man, like, you know, you're not gonna eat that for dinner tonight and you're kind of starting to check in on them. Man, uh, it was a buddy of mine. And man, it was so crazy because nowadays, you know, you don't do things like this, at least with the knowledge I have. And he was like six foot four or something. And, you know, I'm only five foot seven. So he was like, yeah, I need somebody to work out with. I need a good, I'm like, oh, I'll work out with you. So uh, that was my first lesson, you know, in training people, you know, for their body type. And it, it wasn't working, him trying to do the workouts with me. But when I stepped aside and just started training him, and he started getting really good results and started applying stuff that was, you know, for him. So, it, man, yeah, it was, a, it was a good friend of mine. And he was basically a big, tall, skinny dude. And I turned him into a, a big, tall, buff dude, so. And what was his feedback to you? Was he the guy that was like, hey, this was something I couldn't have done on my own? Or what was, what did he feel like? He wasn't even grateful. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he was definitely grateful, man. And uh, like I said, I got that fulfillment. And just to be able to watch him, I mean, he may have abused, you know, the gift I gave him. You know, he may have stole a couple of girls from me here at the club because, <laughs> terrible. you know, I may have been buff, but he was tall and buff now. So now I think he was just like, all right, come with me. But uh, yeah, was he like, oh, I taught Charles everything he knows. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how grateful, you know, like, yeah, all right, man. See that girl DeVore, I'm going to take her, not you. Yeah, thanks for the gift. But, yeah, that's how grateful he was. But, you know, he, he was really happy. And, you know, he, he went and passed it on because he helped others. And, and how different was it when you, like you said, you weren't helping yourself, you were helping someone else with a different body type, different needs? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was great because I'm also a problem solver, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and I like a good problem. Wow. Let me take that back because I hate math. <laughs> but uh, when, when it comes to certain things, uh, I, I did find I was good at, you know, I, I like a challenge. So it, it, it challenged me to educate myself more. And, and take different angles and, and I got success out of it. So thanks. Yeah. I think that that was something I didn't want to admit. Cause some of my first buddies I lifted with, they were probably five, seven, five, eight, five, nine, and I'm six, two. So not quite six, four, but okay. what are some of the differences? Cause I think a lot of people out there don't know if that's real or not. Is it different to train someone that's real tall and skinny versus someone uh, shorter man, with a big I, frame? First off, I'm, I'm going to go into some things, but it's physics. It's, it's, it's normal. So, so yeah, it is harder for you to lift something off of your chest, you know, with those long arms, you know, compared to me with a short person and I have, you know, my, my whole body mechanics are different. I'm, I'm lower center of gravity. You know, I'm, I'm made for, you know, certain type of movements. Um, you're longer, you know, same thing with squats and deadlifts, you know, your lower health, uh, lower pelvic hip complex is completely different than mine. So, you know, your, your bones are longer. So you definitely have to make a lot of adjustments to a different type of workouts and understand, you know, the body and, and movement. So you do you think that's why I like doing sumo deadlift a little bit better? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Short of the ground. You got clear on knees, you know what I'm saying? Sure. It's, 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 it's definitely, it, yeah, right. You're right there. Boom. And I'm already yeah. up. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's interesting. What are, what are some other, maybe not tall, short, but is it true that like how much do genetics play a role in how you're trained? All right, man, that's a good topic, man. I, I love the topic of genetics because you know, a lot of people don't talk about epigenetics. You know, uh, genetics are very important because, I mean, if you look at the video, pretty sure you can see my calves from the front. You know, I suffer from uh, SCD. Oh, yeah. Small calf disorder. It's okay, man. A lot of people do. I appreciate you saying yeah. that. <laughs> but, it, but also, you have a larger frame, you know, so your, your muscles are a little bit longer than mine. But, no excuse for hard work, man, because I see some yeah. big, tall guys with big calves. So. But the genetics are a factor, um, and, and you see it, you know, in different body types, different muscle types. Um, you can see the genetic disposition, you know, a baby when they're born next to another baby you know, that early. If they have a bone structure that can handle certain loads, you know, they're going to be, you know, it's going to be easier for them to build muscle. 
you know, if their structure isn't made for that, it's going to be harder. So, you know, it is what it is. However, God made us, but we have to work around it. So some people actually are bigger boned than other people. <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah. But then you have epigenetics where your environment and you look at hard work, you know, you put someone in the right conditions and, you know, they can build a better body than somebody that is genetically gifted, you know, already. So if I have, you know, this nice you know, broad shoulder frame, but, you know, my at early age where my, my bones are going under um, uh, that growth and, you know, we're going under building, you know, new um, uh, muscle and bone and tissue. If I'm under a harsher environment, my my body is going to be able to take more. So that means I can build more compared to someone, if they are, they have a genetic gift of, you know, a, a good muscular frame, but they have a soft life. I mean, the other guy that's been going hard for the past, you know, 15 years, man, by the time they're 20, he's going to be better off. Yeah, it's, so I remember I saw this one thing where, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, they were studying why in the powerlifting competitions, none of the guys from the Nordic countries had any of the knee issues. And they found out the logging industry was so big there that they were actually training reverse walking all the time. So that yeah, might be yeah. kind of like an example of what you're saying where the that's, environment played yeah, a bigger some, role. Huge, yeah. Now they're automatically building the muscles at an early age that protect the joints. So anything they do from that point on is going to be you're going to be taking a lot more than somebody that's been pampered and just been uh, sitting around on computers. Yeah. So that's something that I know a lot of my audience is going to be interested in. You know, a lot of people, while it's great that the world's become more automated and work is maybe easier physically than it was 30 years ago. I don't think that's always a gift. I think sometimes that can be a curse. So what are some of the things you would advise to someone who might have either a virtual position or a work from home desk job? Man, I got a lot. Um, having a sanitary job, is man, that's a huge reason why we have so many posture um, issues. And if you're trying to be about this life where you're trying to lift and build muscle and you know have keep your health in order, you definitely have to make movement a priority. You know, in your life, if you're sitting down a lot, uh, stretching, you know, taking the time, taking the proper breaks, um, getting up, moving your body a lot more, getting that blood circulating is is huge. Um, doing exercises outside of your work, but also at your desk, you know, on your break, doing the small things, parking further away, taking the stairs is huge because activity and exercise you know, is life. So if, if you're sitting down more than you're moving, man, you're, you're after, that means that's where your body is most of the time or most of those 24 hour periods, which means that's where your body's going to usually be able to operate in. And unfortunately, if something thrown at something thrown at you in life is not always going to be from a, a desk. You know, you sit at a desk. You know. So what what would be the right amount of times per day? Let's say I work from nine a.m. to five p.m. at my computer, sitting on a couch. How many times a day should I probably be going for like a fifteen minute walk? Okay, so regular nine to five sitting at a computer. Well, in a normal workplace, it's the reason why we have these breaks, you know, in place because. It's not smart to be sitting there for so long. So just taking your normal breaks, you know, half an hour to an hour lunch and getting up and doing something, taking a couple 15 minute breaks, you know, would be good. But for me, if I'm sitting down at a computer, I mean, how much time am I staring, you know, hurting my eyes? You know, I would probably take a lot more breaks if I had to stay down, you know, at least, you know, every couple hours, yeah. you know, to where I'm, I'm resting my eyes or, you know, taking, you know, sitting back, taking a breath, you know, oxygen is life too. you know, breathing, doing breathing exercises, um, making sure you're wearing, you know, these type of glasses, these um, uh, blue screen. Uh, so I had that happen glasses. to me two years ago. The first time I did not realize that that was a real thing you have to protect. And yeah. have you heard of these uh, blue light migraines? Yeah, I got one. So it was just like a Tuesday morning and I didn't have a headache when I woke up. But when I was looking at my phone, I couldn't read anything on it. Like it was all blurry and yeah. I didn't realize. So I started looking it up. I'm like, oh, that's what these classes are one buys. Yeah, it's, it's a real thing, man. And I didn't realize it until I took my 44 year old ass back to college. Yeah. And I was uh, looking at my screen way too much. And I was like, I can't do this. I'm not, I don't know why. Everything's blurry. I'm getting up. 
Um, I always get up in, in the morning. It's taking like way too too much time for my eyes to come into focus. And it's weird because you can see other people, but the phones and the TVs and computers are what hurt. Like that was my thing. Is like I could look at Katie and she was clear as day, but then back to the phone and I'm yeah. like, well, I think what well, my between the screens and then being in gyms with all these lights, you know, it was, yeah. just, it was just way too much, too many, way too much light, you know, in my eyes, too much artificial light, so. So I see on the internet, a lot of these guys encourage, like, get sunlight first thing in the morning. Is that pretty important? Oh, man. It's life. I mean, we, we're so detached from nature and what we, you know, used to uh, do traditionally and, you know, be more in tune with our circadian clock where everything's artificial. You know, our environment, our light, our water, <laughs> our, our air. I mean, toxicity just in our environment and our houses is terrible it's you know? yeah a lot of people don't realize that it is a lot worse than you think yeah usually worse than right outside where you in these days where you have to be forced to stay inside you know your own breathing space you're coming out from like bad conditions outside to worse conditions in your house um <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, I work with a home inspector and that was one of the scariest things I started realizing is like how many people, they're never checking their vents. They're yeah. never checking what's going on with the plumbing in their house. And it's like, that's where you're trusting two major sources of survival, oxygen yeah. and water. Huge, yeah. But yeah, but outside of that, yeah, vitamin D. I and mean, the reason why we're alive is because our planet is the one in the solar system that is tilted and just, just perfect enough to have light and sustain us having water. You know, so... So is that kind of what happens whenever it's like the first day it's 60 and sunny in Ohio, everyone feels like... Every, man, it's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's beautiful, man. Like whenever you, you get a, a sunny day in the winter, man, you just feel like rejuvenated. You're like, wow, man, okay. Yeah, so that vitamin D is, a, is so important first thing in the morning. So trying, I mean, it's so hard with our life and our environment and our shift yeah. work. So it's hard to just, okay, I'm going to wait to you know, wait till myself sun, yeah. with natural light. No, we got to get up and start our day. But, you know, limiting, you know, having salt lamps and having low lighting, you know, and then, yeah, getting that first dose of sun, you know, it's good at the glasses. Because I've heard it's pretty important if you get that first sun early in the morning that that actually sets your circadian rhythm. It, it kind of tells it to begin. It does. And it's just so crazy how, you know, if we just, you know, got into, you know, certain things like that where we're more in tune with nature, with grounding, you know, our circadian rhythm. You know, we, we actually will feel better overall. So my mom claims to not be a hippie, but the one thing she always had us do as kids was take your shoes off and go stand in the grass. Yeah, man. And it's crazy that it like, feels so good. it feels good. But then two, the inflammation studies that are coming out is crazy. I mean, like we we're, we're actually made of the same stuff as this earth. I mean, come on, like, like the, the minerals and things that were in our body. That's why we require them, you know, and our food to keep us going. So, there's a natural detoxing, a natural connection that we have to the earth. And, you know, what are we doing? And my girlfriend's a sneakerhead, so she got me these. So sorry, baby. Hey, shout out. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we're, we're limiting our connection to the ground. So yes. that's also why I like to work out barefoot, you know, because a better connection to the ground for any type of movement. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of this stuff that I've noticed a lot of people know. And if they are one to one, they'll talk about it, but they don't share this stuff publicly. And I know another big one is the seed oils. You and I have talked about this, you know, before we've done some of our filming sessions. And for people who don't realize, let's say they're pounding the almond milk all day in high mm -hmm. volumes, like one, how bad are seed oils? And two, what are they in? Let's, let's, let's put it like this along with anything that's processed. You know, anything that we put in our system, you know, becomes part of us. You know, people don't, they forget about this, that when you're chewing these Snickers and eating all these Cheetos or whatever, you know, that's going into making actual tissue of your body. So, y'all build out of Snickers and Cheetos. And that's a hard thing to accept at some points where if you're stressed and you're like, all oh, this food makes me happier, it probably doesn't. Yeah, you know, it doesn't. But, um... So, like, what are some of those common foods that maybe people, like, in the news, it seems healthy, but the reality is it's not? I'm, I'm going to break it down. Choc chocolate and candies. Um, it's, it's a lot in there. People don't realize. We were just talking to, uh, my, I was talking to my girl about vegetable oils. She's like, why is it in everything? You know, but all these oils, these um, ultra-processed oils, you know, they're, they're, they're gunking up our system. Our system. You know, these, um, these, type, these are the type of fats that we don't want in our body and that accumulate and toxify our body. And 
I've been saying candy, you know, because everybody liked that. But let's go to the salty snacks. They're in all of those. Um, let's go up and yeah, like Cheez Its. That broke my heart when I started learning about seed oils <laughs> and I saw Cheez Its had it. I was like, oh, it's a close friend. Yeah, right. You know, so um, and these uh, partially hydrogenated and uh, hydrogenated oils. They're it's like a big block of plastic. You know, they're melting down and they're combining all this garbage, pressing out um, the oils and. Just by the time it becomes a product, you know, you're, you're getting a, a lot of crap. Um, there's different types that are pressed, but and I think the name is even misleading. Seed oils. It's yeah, not it really the seed. Yeah. yeah, it's an oil, like most seeds. If you crush them, you're seeing no oil. Yeah, but then it's like this is a lot of factory oil and things that aren't even actually food that are being mixed yes. with a small ingredient yes. of food. Yes, it's, it's, it's crazy. So, yeah, so if you want to cook your foods in, like, all these chemicals and all this stuff, that's going to gunk up your system. And, you know, you, it, I mean, our, our body's exposed to cancer and a lot of things. And the reason why we have it is our body's just exposed to it, and we're throwing it in our body so much where our body's just like, I just can't fight it no more. It's just going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and so, like, canola oil, I know, is another one. Yeah, all of that stuff, man. It's just it's terrible. I mean, Chronic disease and, and all these issues that we're having, you know, it's, it's, it's behind you know, a lot of the stuff that's in our food. And that's one of the big ones. Um, and it's the reason why these things are banned in other countries. You know, it's also why other countries are more healthier than us. And I think that's a thing, too, because, like, I remember when I was in, I think, college, um, we went to Europe for the first time. And the first uh, thing you realize is, why is there no fat people? <laughs> it's right. crazy, yeah. but it, there, there really isn't. And uh-huh. then you start realizing how much stuff is in our food. Like you said, I think Mountain Dew was the one, I forget what country in Europe, but it's illegal. Yeah. Like they treat it <laughs> as if it's like a, something you can't put in your body. Right, Whereas yeah. like in places like Ohio and Tennessee, it's the cheapest yeah. drink you can get. Man, it's people just, that, that is their primary source of hydration. Right? They, they'll be out there on the court. You know, let me get a Mountain Dew dog. And it's hard. So I think a lot of people are embarrassed to admit that because let's just say they don't have the biggest budget to go to the grocery store every month and they weren't raised in a house where they know what you and I know right now. So what do you think are some of those starter steps for someone on a budget to just cut the shit out of their diet? Uh, man, first off, you know, you can either hire me or, you know, get some of the free stuff that I offer that this yeah. down basic stuff. Um, but a small step to do is just reducing it. Um, I talk about epigenetics earlier and if our environments have an influence on our genetics and that's one thing that we have control over, why would you bring it into your house? So the first thing you can do is just stop bringing it into your house. Okay. If that's the second place you spend the most time to besides your work, boom, you just eliminated a huge problem. All right. Um, second is, be mindful of what you're eating. And if you don't understand it, it's easy. If you don't understand it on a label, then you probably shouldn't put it in your mouth. So that's something easy you can understand. So it, it's not complicated, you know, say, okay, what was this? What is that? Boom, okay, look, read the ingredients. If you're buying green beans, it should say ingredients, green beans. Oh, yeah, nothing else. Maybe something, maybe water. You know, if it says sulfuric something, acid something, all right, you know what? It's not green beans. Yeah, anymore. I don't care if you got parentheses, that absorbic acid is vitamin C. Then put vitamin C in there. Or put, what, 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 all right, so now you got to look up absorbic acid, all right? And then if you look it up, most likely they're going to tell you the good version of it. They're not going to tell you the bad version of it, that where it comes from is all that damn corn that you see out here. So it's over tealed which means you're not actually getting really good nutrients from it. And they're pulling it out just because it's a good thing that they have in this country that they give farmers money to grow and that they put in everything. So, yeah, so they want to make as many uses for it as possible. So, yeah, there's a key one. Yeah. Orbic acid. Yeah, watch it, out for it's, that. It's not the best thing for you, you know. But, you know, that aside, just it, just be mindful of the ingredients. Um what are some of the safe foods? Let's say like two to three foods where if they're like, I know I eat shit, I'm getting Burger King every day. I'm going to go to the grocery store. What are some of the base foods they should start with? Okay. First off, I know it's expensive. I know it's hard, but you might want to take a trip down the fruits and veggies. And you might want to just ignore the price and go to organic. You know, because one thing you should always have is good fruits and vegetables in your house. Um, 
I'm not getting to all the stuff about, oh, you know, this is bad for you, or, or this is this. Um, do what you can. Organic and fruits and vegetables, colorful, colorful vegetables, um, greens. That's, that's a good place to start. Um, guess what? What's the ingredients? Vegetables, whatever the dang old thing is. Yeah. All right. You know, you ain't got to go all crazy about only other thing that's, that's going to be in that vegetable or uh, be on that vegetable when you eat it is what you add to it. All right. And you got control over that. So that's that's one thing. Um, the second thing is get rid of all of the bad oils. All right. It's a lot of them to mention. How about this? Keep the good oils. It's only a few of them. <laughs> yeah. What are they? Um, avocado oil, coconut oil. Really easy. You see this a lot. Olive oil. Those are three right there that I cook cook with all the time. Oh, man. All my meals are great. Every, and a, and a, and a good well. thing to do would just be, if it's not those three, don't even bother. Don't look at it. Yeah, they, right there. Um, if, I know you, you probably cook a lot of stuff you know, for the holidays. And I just talked to somebody about this, about they got to fry a turkey in peanut oil. You probably do. Nobody's perfect. But I can guarantee you, if you're not eating peanut oil, the other 364 days a year, it's okay to eat it on Thanksgiving for your fried turkey. All right. Guess what? You earned it. Yeah. You know, but when it's seven days a week, seven days a week, stay away from it. Stay away from all those other crazy oils. All right. And then now let's go to the other side. Let's say someone is either running a business or they got a good paying job and they don't care about budget at all. Where do they start at the grocery store? The world is yours. Hire a chef. <laughs> cook only organic uh get only uh wild caught uh grass fed you know uh organic boom that's if you got the money you know go to whole foods um but still yeah always read the labels you know because i shop at whole food and um me and my girls the other day we was going there we was just telling her mother that yeah, you can shop here, but no matter where you shop, you got to read the labels because you're still going to find some bad ingredients because at the end of the day, they have a demographic that they're um, supplying to. And if it's inside their guidelines, which their guidelines do go up pretty high because they have some of these oils that I'm talking about in their foods. So you, you rest assured, you know, you can still find some bad stuff in here, still read the labels. But that is one place um, that, you know, uh, Trader Joe's, uh, all these are uh, a place that you're going to find some good organic um, food um, that has the proper seals on them where you know that you at least are getting some of the bad stuff out there, yeah. you know, or you're at least you're avoiding some of that bad stuff. And for your higher ticket, like nutrition clients, what is the actual stuff you're helping them with? Is it a lot of that? Like, do you read a lot of labels for people or do you well, kind of help them with the plan? Yeah. So my higher ticket guys are people that get my top tier services, I have to go through your house, man, because the environment is key. Also, I have to talk to the whole family because everyone has to be on board. Um, and there has to be some type of fix for everyone or some type of um, supplementation <laughs> for for everyone um, for their uh, meal. I have to make sure that they understand when they're grocery shopping. So I go through all the labels um, and then... We have to go back to the house and I have to make sure they know and understand how to cook and season the food so it still tastes good because I'm a foodie first, all right? <laughs> before before I was a healthy guy and before I was in the athletics, before I was in a DH, I was a little fat kid and I love cake. Man. So if someone so, out there is blaming flavor, oh, well, I don't want to cut or diet because flavor, that's a bullshit excuse. Oh, that's bullshit, man. Like, look at my recipe books. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I've done this long enough and I, I've been through uh, enough different diet frameworks. Um, as long as you have the key principles behind, you know, dieting and understanding activity, you know, with intake and understanding fasting, you know, basic things about, you know, what, what, what we should do when we're eating and how to eating to get good results for health. You're good. What's the like biggest difference a lot of those families or people you've trained on the nutrition side have felt? Like, is it clarity? Is it just like a piece in the body? Because that's a big transformation. I know a lot of people want it. They probably just don't know how to ask for it. That's the biggest thing people struggle with is diet, you know? So, and that's, that's one thing that in America, we're really highly miseducated on, you know? And so when, when you get, we actually understand, oh, this is how it's done. or Oh, this is what this is. 
it's a game changer, you know, because if you didn't know that this whole time you were sabotaging your diet and you thought you was cooking healthy because, you know, hey, I've been like skilleting my greens, you know, my, my, or my, my, my chicken. And, you know, I've just been doing using light, you know, canola oil. You know, okay. man, you good. You, you took a step back. All right, let's take a big step back, you know, and take away, you know, the stuff that's damaging like your, your genome because like, yeah. that stuff actually messes with your genome. That's how bad it is. And do you see a lot of your clients once they make a big switch like that, do they want to go back to the food they were eating before or do you kind of save them for a long time? Look, we're only human. And guess what? Everybody always wants to go back to certain things because those uh, neural pathways are, or that myelin is like built deep, you know, yeah. over bad habits of eating those Cheetos and those snacks. So yeah, you want it. But the good thing is now your body and your gut is completely changed by having all this good stuff. Your body instantly rejects it. So you feel like crap, you know, when you put that stuff in your body. So eventually you don't, I, I used to be a, I admit I used to eat at least one king size, king size pack of Reese's a day. And, and my excuse was because I knew how to be anabolic, and I knew um, from my d- dynamics, I knew to eat it right after my workouts, you know, to spike my insulin. I took all that fat and all the garbage in with it, but my excuse was it has a little bit of protein and it's enough sugar to spice my, uh, uh, spike my insulin after my workout, you know, to uh, you know, start that protein synthesis right, off right. So You've probably heard, how clever are some people's excuses as to why they don't diet? Oh, man. Bulking season. Man. Like, like that's, that's, that, that's like one thing. Like, I, I know people that's been, like, bulking their whole life, you know what I'm saying? Because all they know how to do is eat and lift. You yep. know what I'm saying? They don't know how to diet down. They don't know restriction. They don't understand. Or it's always in, like, two months. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, dude, I mean, all kinds of excuses. I got people, uh, man, I, I'll probably get a lot of heat for this. <sighs> there's, there's certain things about image, you know, that's being going out there and being positive about it. And there's nothing. You always want to be positive about yourself and who you are image but i hate when people glorify you know someone that's overweight yeah i mean i don't care you definitely be happy with yourself but also be moving forward and thinking about your health because yeah i don't i don't think anybody is supposed to be sitting around here you know to the point they can't move or they can't like be a normal person and and i think it's sad because it almost seems like preying on the weak like, I'll be very vocal about it. It's something that's bothered me. I lost both my grandparents in their early 60s due to poor diet, low activity, and it broke my heart. You know, I was, a, I, was I think, in second grade for my first grandparent, and then I, you know, early high school for the second, and it always felt like this avoidable thing. Yeah. And I think for me, one of the things that bothers me is that, yes, you should always love yourself and be happy, but if you can acknowledge that the human body is not designed to have 100 extra pounds of body fat on it, a true act of loving yourself would be how did I get here and how do I get rid of it? And you don't necessarily need to hate yourself in the process. Cause I think that's the other side of misbelief too, is like you can only yeah. be jacked if you hate yourself, which I think is the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, that's, that's completely... yeah. yeah. But why, why do you think people think about that? Cause I think this is something important that is at the core of it. Like if someone, let's say they are overweight, they've been struggling, you know, their life got busy and they catch themselves. Like, what are the things, cause you talked to me about this. What are the things you do when you first have someone come to you and they acknowledge like, I don't need a little bit of help. I need a lot. All right. Let's start off where you're at. You know, let's see what we can do, what we can do. It's always small steps. I mean, no matter what, if you want it, you want it and you know, you'll find out how much you want it, you know, and you may think you want it, but you don't really want it that much enough to do some of this hard work, but it's okay. If you just keep consistent and do the small things, let's cut sugar out for a week. And then after that, I'm going to reduce sugar. Yeah. That's something small. I'm going to go for a walk five times a week after dinner. Small things. I just say, let's start selling small. Let's meet where, you, meet where you're at. But also, you know, let's really be realistic with where you're at. That means let's look at what's causing this. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, like what, what are the habits or what, what, what got you here? And you have to really understand that in order to develop that why and at least to have understanding of where not to go back to. Because if you don't understand why you're there in the first place, then you'll never get out of it. Yeah, like a month ago, I cut out, I had to, you know, because obviously when I'm around you and I have to edit these videos and I'm like watching you talk, it's hard to, you know, 
not look in the mirror. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I'd admit to myself was every morning I make these protein pancakes and I would okay. say it's protein pancakes, it's the chocolate chips. Oh, uh, okay. And I had to acknowledge to myself, I'm like, if I cut these out, what do I miss? And it was the sugar. Yeah. And the difference after day four was like, I miss these things so bad, my day's gonna suck. Whereas now, I feel like if I do it one morning, it's gonna go right back to, every, and I can't. Oh, uh, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, so for a lot of people <laughs> out there, when was, if, that, was that your first meal? Oh, man. And I would get that. Mm, yeah, I'm about to say, And man. I wondered why I hated 1 p.m. Yeah, man, like, wow, you was waiting to, like, just crash that lunch. But yeah, now it's more like, you know, I'm doing all right. It's yeah. a little more steady. That's but good. for people out there, so you're not, if someone's really overweight, you're not, like, screaming at them on a treadmill. You meet them uh, where they're at. Yeah, meet them where I'm I mean, don't get me wrong. Eventually, I'm going to scream at you at some point. That's, I'm an accountability guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but that's just only because I love you and, I, and I'm being realistic. And the reality is, at the end of the day, it's going to take hard work. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but also, we got to look at where you're at because I can't just go in there and start smoking somebody. And by smoking, I mean just going hard on them on a workout if they're overweight and haven't worked out, you know, in so long. You know, I also can't go hard on them if they're not able to check their complete environment. You know, maybe they're overweight and maybe they live with their parents. And maybe their parents are, mm -hmm. like, at a point where, guess what? You ain't changing my ways. You know, guess what? We're good. You need to change your ways. You know, some people got that mindset. So they don't. They don't have control of the environment. So you have to meet them somewhere where they're at. You know, uh, everyone can't just kick off like, all right, man, I got a plan. All right, I got you. All right, I got. I shopped and got the full grocery list from Whole Foods. It only cost me three thousand dollars for a week worth of groceries. <laughs> but hey, I'm ready to go. Everybody don't have that. You yeah. Know? So. And so for you, what is the like? Have you had people that are like that though, where they hire you and like week one they're like, all right, Charles, let's get it rolling. Yeah, definitely, man. Like, uh, <laughs> I just had somebody just recently. Um, and she probably won't hire me now, but um, yeah, she said she had a Vegas trip in uh, 30 days. <laughs> and she wanted a 30 day plan. I haven't even looked at her, but I'm, I'm hoping, you know, they're already at like at least a point where they just want some fine tuning in 30 days. Yeah. But yeah, if, if you haven't worked out in six months and you got to, trip in 30 days I'm like guess what i can help you out to a certain point but i won't hurt you because yeah. i can get you maybe some really good results in 30 days but guess what you're gonna feel like ish and guess what you're gonna relax it's gonna be tough it's gonna be tough you're gonna be hurting you're gonna enjoy yeah. your vacation so yeah no nah, I'm, I'm very realistic yeah and so what's a typical timeline for someone let's say like if their goal is this summer i'm going to the beach i want to feel good like when is the right time to actually start the prep for that all right. <laughs> the, and the reason why I laugh is because, you know, one, this, this, this depends on anyone. All mm -hmm. right. Um, depends on where you're at. And, and that's, that, that exactly is the answer. It depends on where you're, where you're at. So, but uh, if, let's just say, you're in bad shape and you want to look like somebody in a magazine which or somebody on Instagram, man, give yourself a year. Because... That's a, that's a transformation. That's a transformation. A transformation is a year. A, a year is a good time for you to fit in with your life, you know, to make small steps, you know, calibrate here. Um, yeah, the worst thing is, is someone just to be like, all right, man, I got this coming up and I, I, I got this many days or uh, come on. It's already too late. Yeah, it's already too late, most likely. Um, but I do do most of my programs in a 90 day program because in 90 days, I can at least. Um, push you hard enough to get a transformation and I can at least instill, you know, enough knowledge, you know, that after nine days, you know, you can walk away and still go with or without me, you yeah. know, on that rest of your year, you yeah. know, for your transformation. Um, but it, it, it just depends on what, what, what you got going on. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Cause I, I mean, I had buddies in college that would do that. It would be like the last month and they were like, Oh, I'm just eating 200 calories a day. And yeah. I'm like, I all the time. don't know if that's, and let's talk about that. Is that helpful or is that just killing the muscle and the fat? Man, look, you have something called a, a BMR, your basal metabolic rate. You know, that's the amount of food that it just takes to keep you alive, keep your heart going, your brain, your lungs while you sleep. You know, a guy like me, I'm five, seven, um, been kind of gained a little muscle. So I'm about 190. It takes me about like seventeen hundred calories just to keep me alive. Yeah, now, I got some fat here because I'm bulking too a little bit, you yeah. know. But it's three thousand five hundred calories in one pound of fat. Okay. Yeah. So you do that math on 
on how big a person is or how many pounds they got and they, how much they're trying to lose. For me, uh, it takes me about two weeks, you know, to cut down. And how, so this is what I want to ask. I see this a lot with business owners. How damaging it is to eat a very small amount of food when that small amount of food is the Reese's, the quick Burger King. Let's say they're only getting 700 calories, but it's shit. Like, is that worse? Oh man, it's terrible. Cause your body's going to just constantly store. Your body's going to burn and then it's going to store. And it's going to store at a, at a crazy rate because it's freaked out. Cause it, it thinks that you're not going to get a lot. So it, it thinks that you're just like operating in a time of uh, famine. So it's going to try to store up extra fat to keep you alive, to hold on for later for long periods of famine. And then what does that do to the brain? Like, are, like is it common that you're going to then see signs of anxiety, depression, all uh, that stuff? You can see signs of, <laughs> first off, if you're not getting the right type of food, then that means you're not feeding your body the right type of nutrients. If you're not feeding your body the right type of nutrients. You're not feeding the organs you know, the right type of nutrients to function, right? So that was the most important one, the brain, right? So brain fog, everything, depressions, you know, uh, you're going to be sleepy. You're going to be crashing. You're going to be going through crazy cycles throughout the day. And yeah, you're going to have jacked up guts. Yeah, like, because most of the people I think I know that would probably benefit from working with you, I think their actual pull would be on the brain side. So like, what is like, are there ways to optimize diet to where you genuinely can make your brain way sharper? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. Well, first off, it's a big one I talk about a lot is fasting. All right. Now, fasting for a long period of time, eating junk is not what you want to do. That's what we were just talking about. It's just taking crazy um, uh, amount of time of not eating and then just eating crap. Uh, what you do want to do is have a good amount of time to fast to optimize digestion. Digestion, because digestion takes a lot of uh, blood. Mm -hmm. And when you're taking away a lot of blood from digestion, where are you taking it from? You're taking it from every part of your body, including your brain. So that's why a lot of religious you know, practices and uh, fasting is popular because now you're more um, susceptible to um, spirituality because now you have less fog and less you know, blockage from your, your mind from everything else that's going on. Cause you can't clear your thoughts cause you can't, you can't operate correctly. So, and when it gets past intermittent fasting, I think this is something you and I talked about actually in the sauna, um, autophagy. So we're talking about how, when you eat low amounts of food and they're bad, cancer can be expected. But when you don't eat food long enough, autophagy is when your body actually starts burning all the crap in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, guess what's up in all that fat it's toxins. It's all kind of crap. Um, just just burning off local resources in your body is huge, you know, because it holds up all the other processes. Um, just you're, you're more efficient overall, you know, as a human being if you are fasting properly. And the studies show if you eat less, you live longer. Now, <laughs> that's especially towards America. That's like, let, let me reframe that. Yeah. People that eat less, you know, and still eat healthy, live longer, you know. Um, so those are the people in other countries, you know, where they're not gorging on everything. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. Um, outside of, you know, clearing your gut, it's also putting the healthy things in your gut. You know, EPA, DHA, one of the things I, told, mm -hmm. I talked about, um, that's one of the few fast that can um, or pass the blood brain barrier. Uh, the blood brain barrier. So, if there's something that can pass and that can nourish, you know, you definitely want to put that in there. Mm -hmm. um, as far as cognitive caviar, that's one of the richest sources. It's the reason why, you know, aristocrats and um, royalty you know, used to eat that stuff. You know, it's, that's a high functioning, you know, uh, really? food. Yeah. I got offered it once and I hated it. And yeah. I didn't know. Okay. Cause I was wondering, I was like, how did these become a thing? So that's okay. Yeah. One of the richest sources. So, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, having the right type of foods, uh, sleep. Sleep is something that's huge. And of course, probably people you're talking about, it's hard for them to get past that because of the lifestyle they have, especially if they're in um, high pressure. You know, you can't turn your brain off at night. Um, guess what? If your diet's a little bit better, <laughs> you'll actually yeah. be able to sleep better. Um, but that goes in line with meditation and being able to um, 
balance your life by quieting things down and just not taking in so much. I know, I know it's hard, but you have to make time to do these things. If it's almost crazy. It's like you have to make time to not do something. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. That's the life uh, that we live, though. You know, we're busy, busy, running, running. Projects. And how, how bad is it to not get good sleep consistently? Like, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they claim I'm going through a grind phase. But, like, at what mm-hmm. point is that actually not helping you at all? Oh, man. I wish I had my – I was ready for that one. But um, if I can read you the exact numbers, but the studies they show on people with, you know, sleep deprivation, anyone was with this uh, – was it law enforcement? Um, that was big because I used to be a cop. And it just showed their performance, you know, after missing an hour of sleep, you know. Same thing with doctors. They did these tests, you know, and they just showed just like you're looking at 20%, you know, after just one hour of, you know, uh, cognitive cognitive decline, you know, just from one hour. So if you're only, if you're missing, if you're, you have 20% cognitive decline with just one hour Come on, your buddies are missing way more than that. They're probably like me, you know, probably maybe getting four to six hours of sleep a night. I think they tell me five to six, which means it's really two to four. Right, yeah, exactly. You know, where you're not entering that deep sleep where all those anabolic hormones come into play, you know. So aside from the business world, you know, back to fitness, you know, if you're not getting enough sleep, that means you're not getting the most out of your workouts and that eating during the day. So you're not getting the most out of your gains. Um, so your body's not recovering as, as efficient as it could, which also means, you know, your brain isn't getting what it needs to do. Either, so. so that's something I was, I forget who I was talking to the other day, but it, I was breaking down that basically muscle is not actually built when you're doing this. It's when you're sleeping and recovering. And yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. No, muscle is broke down when you're doing this. Now, if you break it down and you don't recover, what do you end up with? It's a broken down fucking muscle. You know, you're beating a dead horse after a while. So that's why it's important to get, you know, those few things that help the muscles recover. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think sleep's been a, I've, in the last year, I made that a big priority. And what helped me the most, and I think it's actually where you and I met, was sauna. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I knew that if I saunaed in the morning, there was something about that where it almost felt like I knew I was going to eventually get tired. Yeah. So I don't know why, but it helped so much. And then I would start going to bed, not at one or two in the morning, but at like 10 yeah. And then I would wake up it after six. So that was like, I'd say probably I've been a business owner coming on four years. And the last year I would say is the first time I'm consistently getting seven hours minimum. Oh, wow. And it's crazy. Like mm-hmm. the, the shift in, I'm not stressed all the time. I don't feel like I have to like scrap and fight for everything. Yeah. It's different. And I think a lot of people definitely neglect the sleep side. And another part of it was caffeine. And I want to talk to you about that today. Like yeah. how many people are just reckless with their caffeine? Oh, man. Same thing with studies on caffeine. You know, you watch people... So let's talk about our sleep. Um, people that slept or people that drink caffeine um, at six o'clock lost about what two to three hours into the, try to get into their REM sleep. You know, that's what I mean. It's, just, it's like caffeine is going to fuel you, you know, but caffeine isn't meant to like fuel you, you know. Caffeine is actually, you know, the right type of amount of caffeine is good for your brain. You, know, mm. you can add that to it, the right amount, but kind of effed up because you don't give it the right context. You know, people start throwing caffeine in, and now where you at? You're right here at this other part we're talking about now, where too much caffeine messes with your sleep, and sleep is important for you know your cognitive uh, performance. So, yeah, caffeine is uh, it dampens a lot when it comes to um, your recovery. You know? Yeah. Um, also, it is a vasoconstrictor. You know, so. You know, you're, you're not optimizing blood flow, blood circulation, which is huge for anabolism. So if you're trying to be anabolic and try to repair these muscles or you know, you're trying to get blood to the most important part where you think to your brain, too much caffeine is constricting it. All right. So. And so is that what happens when like sometimes I'll have an energy drink in the afternoon and I feel like dumber than before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, a lot of that goes into it. Um, besides the crash. Yeah. You know, your body depleted certain things that it didn't need to and their body didn't get what it needed to because also you probably drink that caffeine to get away from the hunger, you know, or, or, or push a little bit further to do something instead of eating where you probably yeah. should be eating for the natural energy. So now you're going off of this, this, this uh, neural um, input where it's just not as efficient as good wholesome, you know, fuel for your body and your brain. 
Yeah, like about, I think the reason I actually started, because I would be on and off with lifting when I started the business. And about six months ago, when we moved to Cleveland, something shifted. And I think what I realized I was the most regretful of is I thought about how many times I would skip meals to work. And I would use work was the clever excuse. It's like, oh, well, if I'm getting something done, I don't need the meal. But then I realized like that's a never ending game. that's not going to lead anywhere good. So then I would almost reverse it where it's like, hey, I have to eat these meals. And if work doesn't happen, I'll let the work suffer. And so then it got to the point where I realized I have to put these meal times in because then my brain is actually going to work faster because it recovers. Yeah. So it's almost like, you know, at the gym, you can't have someone sit there for three hours benching. Like they have to take a break at some yeah. point. And I was doing that with work. That's a lot of us. A lot of us do that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a mentality. You know, it's a work, work, work mentality, especially if you're an entrepreneur, especially yeah. if you're bootstrapping stuff, you know, you got to work. <laughs> and so for all the, yeah, because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs that are going to be watching this. Like, what do you, what are some of the biggest things you see entrepreneurs do wrong, whether it comes to nutrition or on the lifting side? Oh, man. Neglect it. <laughs> but uh, for me and anybody's entrepreneur, you know, you, look at people ahead of you and people that are successful and you try to mirror their habits and what do the, all the successful people do? The first thing they do in the morning, they start it off healthy. They start off working out, you know, I mean, start off with exercise, some type of exercise, start off with detoxing, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the, the best thing you can do is start your day off as an entrepreneur with exercise. It's, it's going to optimize your brain flow. It's going to optimize your focus. You know, it's, it's going to bring you into the state where you need to be to make some decisions. Um, other than waking up and putting crap in your gut and crashing, you know, drinking coffee and... My okay. protein pancakes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of small things you can do, man, just uh, with, with the exercise. Uh, if you're avoiding it, if if you're not uh, doing it, then you're, you're effed because... How are you going to perform or how are you going to continue to do everything when at some point you're just going to start dying down? You're dying down from energy. You're dying down from your health, um, which is besides the exercise, the nutrition part. We're so busy as entrepreneurs. You know, our biz biggest excuse is, you know, we don't know what to eat when we're out. So and all we have is access to this. Boom, boom, boom. So well, you you fail to plan, you then plan to fail. You know, that's that's. Uh, apply the stuff that you yeah. uh, apply to to your baby, your business, to your body, and uh, unless you run a shitty business, then yeah. don't apply it to your body. You know, maybe <laughs> everyone you just so when I think of everyone I work with, the ones that are the most successful usually up before six at the gym, somewhere between six to seven, and then whether it's like prayer, meditation, or sauna, there is some other like you said detox activity, mm -hmm. and yeah, those are the people that I never see lose their cool. They're always focused. I feel like they take the most action, but it doesn't seem like they're speeding. Yeah. They seem to be more consistent. 100%, man. I mean, that's why I train a bunch of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, because, I mean, even, even, even though in a professional aspect, I'm, I'm, I'm there to, you know, teach them, you know, I, I'm learning from them, mm -hmm. you know, in other areas of business and life, because if someone's doing something right, then uh, listen. Yeah. Listen, you know, so if the guys that are making more money and they're in a place that you want to be in are doing all this healthy stuff, if you're an entrepreneur, that's probably one of the first things you should probably do, you know, because now your brain is better. Now your, uh, your endurance is better, you know. You look better. You're more confident. Yeah. That, so that's actually one of the big ones. I remember they even made me start lifting in high school. I think I was applying for a job at Panera, and I just remember I was the same height as I am right now, and I weighed 145 pounds. Damn. Yeah, so I was just green bean. <laughs> and another guy came in, and he was jacked, same height. And oh, I, me <laughs> I remember we both got the job, but he was hired first. And <laughs> all I thought in my head was that was it. And I don't know. It could have not been. But I think there's also this thing, too, where as much as none of us want to admit it, in business you are a walking billboard, whether you oh, like yeah. that or you don't. And, you know, I love the Arnold quote about, you know, a good physique is one of the few things that can't be bought, can't be purchased, and no one else can do it for you. Yeah. Like, yeah, you need help. You need someone like Charles who knows his shit and make sure you don't mess up. But at the same time, like, you can't lift that weight for yeah, him. Yeah, I can't lift him up, man. You, you, you got to grab the weight. You got to do the reps. Yeah. You got to put it back down. I might load extra weight on there for you. Right? Yeah. That's like with me, <laughs> one of the things that kills me when I get on these calls is people are like, well, I want everyone to know me. I want to be more seen and trusted for who I actually am. But I don't want to talk on camera. And I'm like, 
well, I can't be you. So <laughs> I, I think there's similarity there. But for like, I have, I'm curious, what are some of the signs of your best clients? Like, what do they all have in common? Uh, are you talking commonalities? Yeah. Um, Could be in personality, physique, just any of those. I'm curious. Well, because I, I, I literally just train usually entrepreneurs or CEOs or people who are upper management. They're all hard workers, you know, and they all understand process. Because usually to get to a certain point in life, you know, you have to understand some basic things. You know, and some people that aren't at that level, you know, they don't understand, like, how hard you got to work to really get what you want. And which is also on the reverse side when, you know, at least when I worked for an insurance company, they did their recruiting in gyms because they knew people with good bodies were hard workers. Them is a box of rocks. Who cares? Yeah, they you work hard. Guess what? You understand that persistence, consistency, you know, are, are, are key things, you know, to getting what you want. And you can see that when someone took the time, you know, to build their body. So all you got to do is just apply that effort, you know, to whatever you're doing in life, then you're, you're going to be successful. Yeah. Because very few people can build their body. Yeah. I've always heard that quote where it's like the rewards you have today are from work you did three to six months ago. Yeah. You got to have that mindset. Yeah. And it's hard, but I think, you know, another thing you just pointed out that I do want to talk about is, um, a lot of people I know, family members, friends who they've never lifted or they've never taken their fitness seriously, they're always scared of the gym. It's this common thing where it's like, well, I, I don't want to go there. I'm nervous. Everyone's going to judge me. But one of the things I always try to say to them is where else in your day are you going to find 100 plus people all actively working on themselves for the better? Man, it's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I'll say both gyms, you know, it's a culture because everybody in there is about that life, especially when you see people that come as much as you, you already know, they, they, they know the grind. So it's, a, it's an automatic when you walk by, you tilt the hat. Yeah. Because you are, you and your grinder like I am. And so, that's how we met for people that don't know. I think we knew each other lo loosely for what, a year? You know, I'd see you in the sauna, you'd be training someone while I'm hitting shoulders and over time, you start to understand, like, oh, this is someone who I am playing the same game as. It's yeah. almost like we're living the same life a little bit. Yeah, well, yeah, when, when when you start talking about, you know, the usually, especially with entrepreneurs, you know, at a certain level, you talk about the woes a lot, or you, you just talk about what's going on in business. And it, it's good because a lot of people don't understand what you're going through, and you need that, you know. So it's good to talk to other people you know, and, and have a community like that. And I, I think that's kind of like the community that, you know, a lot of the people, you know, where we, where we were working out at, uh, where we met, you know, they, they all kind of uphold that when we're in there. And as some of the conversations talk, cause there was no fluff. No, no. And, and people are usually talking about, you know, talking from like the same, um, you know, we've we, we been through like, you know, in the same trenches you know, yeah. over the years, especially if you've done it long enough, especially if you, you survive that three year and then the five year, then, then, then you didn't you didn't seen enough to where, yeah, you go talk about some employees, you go talk about uh, some taxes, you know, you yeah. talk about you know codes, building, like whatever you, you, is you're doing, you know, you can talk about you know the woes that we go through, and also some of the positive stuff that come out of it, and you also make connections, yeah, because <laughs> that's one of the things that you do have uh, as an entrepreneur in your back pocket, and 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 it's it's a lifesaver sometimes is your connections your network because if you put out a product you, people need to know yeah you, guess what man you got the right network and you talk to the right people you know they're gonna put your stuff out just like you'll put their stuff out yeah so yeah to wrap it up i think that's a perfect point let the people know like how do you help them because i think a lot of people hear the word personal trainer they're like cool but like what do you actually do to help the people you help so uh i talk to people and like we said earlier i, I meet them where they're at and i develop programs for their exercise and nutrition based off their lifestyle. Um, I also try to at least implement, you know, that change in the environment and break down um, any aspects of health and nutrition from an educational standpoint. Also give them access to resources and tools. Uh, one of my other companies is Regenerative Self-Care and Wellness, where we do holistic health. Uh, my partner over there, uh, she runs the staff and... I mean, it, it, it's enough stuff over there to where I'm able to help my clients because the worst thing I'm able to, the worst thing I had in the past was 
being able to help them to a certain point and then trying to refer them to the current medical institute, you know, that we have. And I'm telling them not to eat this stuff. And then they're going over there and they're giving them a diet to eat, you know, cornflakes and, and bread and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's the one thing that we're trying to take out of you. Yeah. So to build, you know, a partnership with someone and, and have a holistic clinic, you know, that was a huge thing. So I offer those services uh, and also offer um, hormone replacement treatment as well as other holistic um, modalities like functional medicine for gut health, um, massage, and yoga. So if someone knows this is the year to get their health together, you're the guy they can reach out to? Oh, definitely, man. Like I said, I, I have all the resources. All right. Well, hey, thank you for coming on. All right. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. That was episode 12, and we will see you next week.